Dharma feels good because it's not really about you. It's about how you're meant to be of service. Because again, it's creating that solution for the world's problem that only you can be. I check my email and there's an email from Deepak Chopra. And I'm like, what? And it's like, what's your number? I want to call you. All of a sudden, Deepak Chopra is endorsing my book. He wrote the forward eventually of three of my books. And that to me was like the universe being like, don't forget your magic. And that's the beauty of living your Dharma. It actually doesn't require effort because your soul is literally embodying the frequency that it's here to embody. And people just being in your resonance, it inspires them to access that within themselves too. Hello, beautiful humans. Welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast, where every single week we get the honor and privilege to sit down with a beautiful mind and open heart and somebody that can allow us and support us on our journey of knowing ourselves deeper and deeper. Today, my guest is a very fascinating individual that I've gotten the pleasure to know more recently. And uh, she's here to really, I feel, inspire us to help us live in our purpose. Sahara Rose is my guest today. She is a author of three books of the most recent called Discover Your Dharma. She is the host of the Highest Self podcast, which is one of the top spirituality podcasts in the world with over 30 million downloads. She is the founder of the Dharma Coaching Institute and a modern divine feminine mystery school called Rose Gold Goddesses. And uh, I am, uh, I'm very excited to dive into this conversation today because she is somebody that um, I've gotten to know a little bit about her story and her journey. And I feel like it can be really supportive for, uh, for all the listeners and for all of you today. So without further ado, Sahara, mm, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here in this beautiful Hogwarts Slytherin <laughs> librarian dungeon of the podcasting. I love that. <laughs> that's the new title for this room. I got to put on the outside. Yes, that's really what it is. Rebrand. <laughs> yes, yeah, rebrand. Yeah. So good. I think uh, this conversation is going to be really supportive for the listeners, for individuals that are feeling like, you know, our purpose and the word purpose has been thrown around so much these days and it, it very much is in the realm of feeling like people have to do something and and actions and the actions that they take in the world. And I would love to, one, I love having conversations with individuals who feel like they are living their dharma and in their purpose because oftentimes by virtue of getting to that place, there were a lot of times where it wasn't like that and you did not have this uh, dharmic calling where you feel like you're waking up and like living what you were put on here on earth to do. And so, um, yeah, I'm just really excited to dive into this conversation today for how it can support our listeners. I'm excited too. And to see where the winds take us. Yes, absolutely. So um, first I would, I would like to start with a little bit of your background, because like I said, not everybody who feels like they're living their calling in life, it, it wasn't always that way. And your story is really powerful. And supporting individuals feel like there's this idea or idealized version of people that see other individuals that are successful as like an overnight success or they just got lucky or they just figured it out. <laughs> and this is not the case. Like it, it takes a lot of challenges to move through and realizing what you don't want in life and figuring who you're not to then become, you know, who you truly are. And so your journey has been, has been a, a long time coming to this point now where you're being able to impact the world in the way that you do. And so take us on a little bit of a ride yes. with a couple of the most pivotal moments on that journey. Yeah. You know, I used to believe that the only people who could live their purpose were people who had like super spiritual hippie parents who like supported them along the way. And, you know, and I'll tell you my whole story, but I remember being 23 years old in Bali and everyone I met there, I'm like, do your parents know you're here? Like, are they okay with this? Like, <laughs> And it was so mind boggling to me that, you know, some of them, yes, they had beautiful families that were supporting them and some of them no. So I share this because oftentimes the reason why we feel like we're not living our purpose is because I can't because of my family background, my where I grew up, my lineage, my this, my that. And I think that my story shows like you could have like the most fucked up shit basically in your lineage and overcome it. So, you know, my mom was a refugee who fled Iran on foot during the Iran-Iraq war, during the uh, war that was happening where Saddam Hussein killed over a million Iranians and she fled on foot through Turkey, like with a coyote. And both of her uncle both of her brothers, my uncles, were taken as political prisoners and tortured for over a year in Turkey. And, you know, eventually my mom got asylum in the U.S. with like some foreign relative that she lived with and just basically started from scratch here and had two, me two years later. Mm. So 
I grew up like, you know, your womb and, and your, your background, it, it holds on to those imprints of trauma. So I grew up and my dad also fled from, um, the war and revolution in Iran. So with a lot of unspoken trauma that they never talked about what happened because they were the lucky ones, you know, they were the ones who got away and everything's great, but it was focused on survival. So from the time I was a kid, I could always feel that my purpose is here to help people. And I didn't really know how. I just looked at the people who are helping the most people in the world, like Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King and Gandhi and all these people. And I'm like, okay, they all sacrificed their lives for the cause. So that's what I'm going to do. So I just went on this journey from the time I was a kid of really studying human rights. And I was obsessed with learning about, I mean, really heavy things such as sex trafficking and child labor and child soldiers and, you know, all of the worst things that could happen to humans. And I, you know, later in high school created the Amnesty International chapter and I was organizing protests. And then I went to school in DC studying to become an international human rights lawyer. So my entire life was around activism that I need to save the world. (laughs) And I did not even know until I was 18 about my mom's story of being a refugee. They kind of kept that from me. And I didn't know that Amnesty International was the organization that freed my uncles when they were political prisoners. It was like something in my soul just felt it. Mm -hmm. So there I am in college in DC and I start working with different organizations, um, you know, really studying the UN and the World Bank and these like huge global organizations and realizing that they're not totally in integrity. And a lot of these organizations are involved in the very things that they are here to supposedly eradicate. And a lot of these organizations also, the money that they're raising is going to fundraisers and it's not actually going to the people. And that was really distressing for me because here I am trying to help as many people as possible. And I'm realizing those organizations are really not doing that thing. So I had no idea then what my purpose was. Like, I just spent my whole life thinking it was going to be this and it's not what I thought it was going to be. So I was like many college students, extremely confused, not knowing what to do next, just applying for random jobs, trying to figure it out. And at that time I started to go through really bad health challenges. So I, at first it was like really bad digestive issues and then it was hormonal imbalances. And then I stopped getting my period, which continued for two years. And when I got a blood test, the doctor said I went into perimenopause and I was 21 years old. So when you go into perimenopause that early in life, you're going to have bone density issues likely become handicapped by the time you're like 50, obviously never be able to have kids and, you know, a series of things just go out of balance in your body, right? So they prescribed me tons of prescription medications from hormone replacement therapy to antidepressants to gastrointestinal things like the list goes on. And I was never into wellness or anything like that before, but I just knew there had to be something deeper going on in my body that was causing this and that I didn't want to be on all these prescription medications forever. So I just start to learn about natural healing and holistic medicine and nutrition and eventually about Ayurveda, which is the sister science of yoga based on the mind-body connection. And it's when I took a dosha quiz, which are the archetypes in Ayurveda, and I read about the one that I was, Vata Air Energy, it said all of my symptoms from like the digestive issues, hormonal imbalance, but also my personality It was like, you are creative, idealistic, think outside the box, visionary, you love to travel. Like, and I was like, what? Like my digestive issues and my hormonal imbalance are related to my purpose? Like, huh? (laughs) Like, how is that connected? So I became obsessed with learning everything I could about Ayurveda. And I was actually doing volunteer work in India already because I've been doing NGO work from the time I was like 15, working in orphanages and slums. And so I was in India, in Delhi, teaching health and sanitation in the slums there. And I decided I'm going to sign up for Ayurveda school and learn about this. So when I graduated from college, I moved to India where I stayed for two years studying Ayurveda. And it hit me after healing my body and getting my period back and, you know, even being able, my personality, like all these ideas that I had, I was able to bring them to fruition through changing my diet, my, my daily practices, even the types of yoga I was doing, everything needed to shift. 
So I just knew that there were so many people, especially young women, like in our generation who are experiencing hormonal digestive anxiety, all of these issues. So I was like, I'm going to write a book on this. And, you know, I didn't know anything about the book writing process. I was like, I'm just going to write it and like figure it out after once I write it. So I just started writing and writing and writing. And that brought me on the journey of, you know, then really facing off with the ancestral fears that were present in my lineage of, whoa, 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 whoa. you're trying to write a book? Like, who do you think you are to write a book? You're not a doctor. And this Ayurveda stuff is bullshit. And, you know, you need to get a normal job and you can't just be doing this and t- taking advice from all these hippies. And, you know, it, it was a really tough time because I realized then so much of what I lived for was for my parents' approval. And now that I was like really finally living my truth, not only did I not have it, but I was a disgrace to them. And they were afraid of the path that I was on. And because of that, we're saying very hurtful things. So that really began my journey of the embodiment of like, how willing am I to live my dharma, even when it means being disowned from my family, which eventually I was, even when it means having no money and resources. And like, literally, I lived in huts with like rats in it. Like, I had to go to the depths of my devotion for living my dharma. And that was what I call like my soul's unique curriculum, because you can have a sense of purpose, but it's like, okay, now are you willing to become the living resonance of it? Mm -hmm. And that's what I needed to do. So we can go off on any topic from there. (laughs) There's a lot. Oh, there's many topics we can go off from there. (laughs) Um, Thank you so much for sharing. That was beautiful and succinct. And um, I, uh, I just, could you define Dharma and your understanding first, and then we can go from there? Yeah, so the word dharma is an ancient ancient Sanskrit term. So Sanskrit is the language of yoga, Ayurveda, um, Vedic meditation. And originally the, the term meant essentially your unique frequency, the unique jigsaw puzzle that you play in the universe, you in your fullest expression. Now it has over 16 ter- terms today because it's been taken in a Hindu context, in a Buddhist context, and all means different things, such as in Buddhism, it means like more of the path of, of Siddhartha. But when I'm referring to it, I'm referring to that ancient origin of your soul's purpose, your unique frequency, the big reason why you are here. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And so for that is a process and it's a journey of you clarifying and like unlearning all the BS that we've accumulated in our life to like actually be able to listen to ourselves and figure out what uh, what is our unique frequency, right? And it's it's beautiful because what is uniquely meant for us is always going to be there for us mm-hmm. and we just have to remove whatever is in the way from it. So it's great. It's not something like we have to go out and find. It's like yeah. we have to go on this treasure hunt to go yeah. find our Where's purpose. Where's Waldo? Where's my purpose? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we just yeah. have to remove what's in the way of it and it will naturally come online. And that's a journey. For your for your specific journey, there's been so many times where there's a lot of people around you that as you feel like that's been coming online, they have different ideas of what your purpose is for you. And yes. so for people that are listening that maybe are in a similar boat of like, they're starting to have their awakening and they're starting to have these insights come in their life. And um, maybe they got introduced to sp- different um, you know, spiritual practices and they're no longer a vibratory match to their current environment. And there's people in their life, maybe their family members that just do not believe what they believe. And it can be very difficult. How have you been able in those moments on your journey, been able to stay true to who you are and what you want to do? You know, I love looking at the chakras and Maslow's hierarchy because it shows that you know, survival is our baseline need. And then once we have survival, we can have our wants. And once we have our wants, we can go for even luxuries. Once we have our luxuries, we can go for self-actualization. We can even look at this generationally. So most of our parents, regardless of where they grew up, were in a more survival mindset that it was focused on getting the security, you know, getting the white picket house and the van and the mortgage. And, and those were the things that really mattered to them. So the internet didn't exist. Being a spiritual life coach definitely did not exist. So of course, from their understanding, the things that we speak about are unheard of. You know, they're completely ungrounded. So of course, the best advice they're going to give us to keep us safe is to not pursue this unknown thing. Mm -hmm. However, if we continue to take advice from that old paradigm, we are perpetuating the old and not moving into the new. 
And our parents likely also made decisions that their parents were not in support of. And every single generation is going to continue to really pass that threshold of what we've known of before. So our parents might genuinely love us and want the best for us and want to keep us safe, but it's from their limited understanding of what's possible. And for us, we need to practice that discernment of, you know, for especially a lot of us, we grew up asking everyone around us for advice. You know, anytime you have an idea, you call a friend, you call your mom, you call someone, and there's a beauty in that as well. But the shadow side of that is you don't know how to tune into your own intuition, you know, and until someone else gives you that validation, only then you can move ahead. So if you are someone like that, I would recommend going on an advice detox. So for the next like one month, do not ask anyone for advice on anything. Not should I post this story or not? Not should I go here or go there? Like start harnessing the energy of your intuition because our intuitions, they speak to us in different languages through the heart layer, through the womb layer, the gut layer, the body layer, and really tuning into the different voices and frequencies of your intuition. And it might start with something as simple as, do I want this or that for breakfast? And like, what is what are the layers of my intuition speaking to me here? And then we can trust ourselves for the more macro decisions in our lives. Mm. It's beautiful. I love that framework. And um, I love the advice detox. We live in such a noisy world where it's like being able to uh, just settle that down a little bit and actually hear what you truly want and what your needs and your desires and your soul is asking, you know, for is uh, is really important. Even, even from social media. Like yeah. today I was like, wow, like it's like, slay the rest of your year. You're not doing enough. I'm like, damn, I'm not doing enough. And it's like, (laughs) you should be resting. Why aren't you resting? I'm like, damn, I should be resting. And it's like, even on social media, everyone's on their own wave. They have their own prerogative, their own frequency. But it's so important if you are someone that doesn't know your own truth to just step away from that and to really tune into what am I devoted to? What does my soul seek to experience? And sometimes in this world, this society we're in, it's very vata, it's very air energy. It's always moving and changing that we start something and then we end it. And then we start something else and we end it. And then we're mad at ourselves of like, why aren't I able to follow through on the things that I want to do? And it's because we haven't taken it from the air to the fire. Mm -hmm. And that fire is the action. It's the discipline. It's the showing up day in and day out. Like this podcast studio, I'm sure it took you months to create it. And here we are and we can play now in this field, but there's the level of action that I feel like oftentimes in the spiritual community, we don't really talk about as much. It's a lot easier to be like, now I'm channeling this and channeling that. And it's like beautiful, but like true manifestation is to take the unmanifest, the unphysical and bridge it down into this world. And that's really what we're all here to do to be creators and creatrixes. Yeah. So there's many things that we just opened that I want to, I want to touch on each of them. We'll, we'll do that throughout the podcast. Um, To first uh, just riff on what you first talked about, just like the, uh, some scars, which are impressions. It's another Sanskrit word, meaning impressions like that we accumulate in our life through social media and all the subliminal messages that we're constantly being fed and delivered that inform our personality because what we accumulate and what we don't properly digest becomes our constitution and how we go up and show up in the world. And so it's so important and it's just a really amazing tip to be able to come back into stillness and, and detox from noise. And that comes in the form of advice and social media and all the things. And then we can start to discover our dharma. And I want us to touch on a little bit for people that don't feel like they know even, like they don't know what their dharma is. They don't even know what direction it would be in. They have some things that they're good at. They have some skill sets. How do you guide individuals that like just don't know? Like they're just in a place where they're not clear at all. Some people have like a a hint, you know, and they want to move in that direction. But there's some individuals that just like are completely clueless to it. So how do you guide those individuals? So I have many, many frameworks and love doing this. I was even a friend of, you might know her, Sky Cohen's. Yeah, yeah. She challenged me to find a random person on the street and in three hours help them find their dharma. And it happened. So oh, really? I love doing it. So the first place I would start is what do you remember love doing that you loved doing as a child? So with the three doshas, these three archetypes, were you that child that was you love to imagine things, arts and crafts, make skits, make up stories? You were really like always just in your imagination. So that's more of that vata, that air energy. Were you that kid that wanted to play outside and do competitive sports and games and just like get rough and and tumble around? That's more of that pitta, that fire energy. 
Or were you that kid that wanted to play house and, you know, take care of animals and like, I'm going to serve you the meal and, you know, do things that were very more homely, nurturing. That's that kafa, the earth energy. So for you, Andre, which mm. one of these three did you feel? And it um, can be combination. Yeah, it's like Pitavata primarily, yeah. 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 So totally, it makes sense that you would, you know, become this videographer, but also a podcast host, which is like the ideas, but also the action of it. Mm. So, so we can see right there, your dosha has been with you throughout your life. Yeah. And for everyone, you were born with this unique combination of the doshas because within your doshas lies your dharma. Mm. So that's a really good place to start. The next place I would say is to take my Dharma archetype quiz. And we can even talk about some of the archetypes. So the Dharma archetypes are these nine archetypes that I wrote about in Discover Your Dharma. And some of them are like, I'm going to just share what I think some of yours are. The visionary, here to channel the new paradigm. The artist, here to bring beauty to the world. The teacher, here to share knowledge. Um, then some of the other ones are the entertainer, here to make people feel. The activist, here to, you know, share important and just causes. The warrior, here to protect and lead. The researcher, here to understand deeply. Um, what have we, the nurturer, here to care and connect. And did I say the entertainer? Yep. Yeah. So those are the Dharma archetypes. I have a free quiz people can take, dharmaarchetypequiz.com. And Understanding that will really help you if you're like, I have no idea what my purpose is. I don't even know what I'm good at. If you get the results of your a nurturer teacher, for example, then you know you have some of the gifts of being able to sit with people and hold space and ask questions mm -hmm. and make them feel safe. And you also have this ability to impart knowledge. Now, where can they come together? So for example, Oprah would be a nurturer teacher. So it's like, what are the qualities of Oprah that I might look up to, you know, because the things that we look up to are often things that we have within ourselves. So taking that Dharma archetype quiz can really help you know how your energy shows up. Then the step after that is I have this process called the Dharma blueprint. So the Dharma blueprint takes five different factors. So it's your Dharma archetype, the mediums that flow through you. So do you love to write? Do you love to plan parties? Do you love to record videos? And then even getting more specific, is it long form videos, short form videos, funny videos, serious videos, podcast, book, is it book writing, blog writing, getting really specific on your mediums because, and our mediums change over time as well. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's important to know how we're going to now express this energy. So some people it's through numbers and data through some people it's through conversations. So your Dharma archetype, your mediums. The next is what are you excited about? So I always say excitement are the breadcrumbs that are guiding you towards your Dharma. And if you ever look at your life now, it's like always the things you were Googling a few years ago, you know, like how to, you know, start a podcast or how to like, for me, it's like, what are past lives? You know, and it was like yeah. right before I started my podcast journey, because those are the things you're excited about. So it's like that fire, that ignition that is going to give you that momentum to follow through something. So what are the things you want to have conversations about? What are the podcasts you're listening to? What are the things if you could just go on a retreat for a week around any topic? what would it be about? Mm. So looking at your excitement. The next thing are, what are some obstacles you have overcome or helped someone else overcome? So you may have helped a parent overcome cancer. And that might be a big part of your purpose of being able to help people heal holis holistically or, you know, share stories for people in a difficult time. You may have had the obstacle of being bullied in school. You may have had the obstacle of moving a lot as a kid or having a speech impediment or, you know, it, it can be huge homelessness or very small of I had the obstacle of not knowing what to wear. And I was always the person helping my friends with, with what to wear. And within all challenges lies an element of Dharma, because all of our dharmas really are here to create solutions for the world's problems. So what are some obstacles and some challenges? And again, as we go through the soul curriculum of life, those are going to change and for example, one of my obstacles was the health challenge that I shared. And then a the huge part of my dharma that was unlocked after that was writing the book and mm -hmm. sharing Ayurveda, which I did for seven years. But then that obstacle was no longer the obstacle that I really wanted to share about, mm -hmm. you know, because I went through then the obstacle of living my dharma. 
And then that became the obstacle that I wanted to share about. And now an obstacle that I share a lot about is speaking my voice. And that is, so it's like, even with our obstacles, I believe we have soul contracts with them, that Mm -hmm. it's like a certain moment of our life is going to be about that. And then you can kind of know when the soul contract is complete because the excitement is no longer there. And then there are other people who are super excited to talk about, you know, digestion or whatever the thing was that you used to be excited about. And you have to trust that. Yeah. So the obstacle and then the fifth thing is your superpower. So what are the things that come naturally to you that might not come naturally to other people? And often it's the things people compliment you on that we just assume like everyone gets those compliments, but it's not true. Like, because you don't give the same compliments to everyone you meet. It's like people are seeing that thing in you. So it might be, wow, you have such an ability to make me feel seen and heard. Mm. Or wow, you're so good with details. Or, wow, you're so good at taking complex topics and making them simple. Or, wow, you have such an organized and strategic mind. So you can even ask your friends, when have you seen me at my best? Mm-hmm. And, and and start to understand through their, their lens what they think that your superpowers are. So for the, to create your Dharma blueprint, you would take all five of these categories and write them all out and then really take it in. And because you're seeing your soul right there. You're seeing it, your soul in manifest form. Right. And then from there, you can start to think about how can these different factors and areas come together. And for some people, it's pretty instant. And for some people, you got to meditate on it for a few weeks or even months. And it's not that your dharma is like, now I need to like monetize this thing, right? But it's like, how can all of these different areas of my life come together into my sacred doing, which is when my being and my doing can merge? Mm, I love that. Mic drop moment. (laughs) <laughs> on the Nelly Self Podcast. That was so good. <laughs> I love all, there's so many beautiful moments in in that. And I think getting clear on like following your highest excitement as kind of your North Star and compass is a really beautiful one because that's going to continually evolve and change. I feel like we discover so much of ourselves in the sharing of ourselves and in the action of doing in the world because you can sit in a room all day and contemplate what is my purpose? What is my purpose? What is my purpose? But in the experiencing of life, in our human experience, we learn. We learn what our obstacles are that often become the way in terms of like that crazy health challenge that's so difficult in the moment then became the fruit of your experience and how you can share in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And that aspect, you learn so much and that informs also your your understanding of Ayurveda and the doshas into your dharma and like they all kind of come together. And I love the Japanese ikigai um, term just because it's just a beautiful framework as well, that cross section between what you love to do, what you're good at doing, what the world needs and what you can get paid for. And Mm -hmm. it's like how you show up in those cross sections. And you just gave a beautiful blueprint for getting clarity on what those actually are. And then that like, where they all overlap is like, that's where the sweet spot is that you can Mm -hmm. wake up and you feel genuinely excited to like wake up and live your life. And um, I feel like our Dharma always has some element of service in it, right? And Mm -hmm. so could you speak to how 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 does that show up? It shows up in a, you know many different ways for different people depending on our form of expression. Um, but yeah, just the energy of what we do in this life, the Dharma has a specific element to where it's it's to be of support to the planet. Yes, yeah, because that's the thing. It's like your Dharma feels good because it's not really about you. Yeah, it's about how you're meant to be of service, and source or whatever designed us made it this way that you want to do the thing and it's exciting and it feels gratifying for you so you can keep doing it because again it's creating that solution for the world's problem that only you can be and at the same time you know so much of my background was well to help the world i need to be the martyr and i need to suffer and the more that i like suffer the more i'm helping the world and it's also not that (laughs) you know i say your dharma is the integration of your highest form of joy with your highest form of service And combining the two, because when you're in joy, you have more energy and you can overcome the roadblocks that inevitably will be faced. But when you're of service, it makes it something bigger than you. So you're not taking it so personally. You're fueled by something that's far greater than you that sometimes people ask me, they're like, how do you have so much energy to do things? And I'm like, because I'm connected to the channel of source wisdom consciousness that I'm literally just plugged into that's using my vessel to show up and speak the words that I meant to speak them to, to the people at the right time. And if I can just get out of my own way, I can continue to be that channel. And that's the beauty of living your Dharma. It actually doesn't require effort. 
Because when you're living it, like, yes, there is action that's showing up. And sometimes it might feel like that. But when you're tapped into your flow, like when you're doing this podcast and you're having these deep discussions, you're not like, okay, like I need to ask the right question and do the right thing and like figure Mm -hmm. it out. And like, it's, it's not that it's, it's that energy of timelessness because your soul is literally embodying the frequency that it's here to embody and people just being in your resonance, it inspires them to access that within themselves too. Mm. Yeah. It's so beautiful that it, it's like when you are living in your Dharma, it it will feel effortless. Mm -hmm. And we live in a generation that feels like, um, we've had so much, we have more comfort and conveniences that we've ever had, but people are so energetically drained and like tired and filled with anxiety and depression. And I feel like it's often like we don't have energy, not because we're doing too much, it's because we're not doing enough of what really lights us up. Mm-hmm. And that's that, that's the process. And you know what we're talking about right now is just like discovering the cross section of all the things that really light us up will give you so much energy to actually go out there and, and execute in the world. Yeah, there's such a collective burnout issue. And burnout really is the result of not being yourself for a long time, you know, because when you're playing the role of someone else, it's going to be exhausting after five freaking minutes, let alone nine to five every day. But when you are fully living your dharma, you are naturally just, again, channeling and creating things that would probably take someone not living their dharmas months or years to do. Because, again, you're doing what you're uniquely designed to to be here for. And I think oftentimes in social media, we see other people living their dharma. We're like, well, that worked for them. So I should do it that way. And then again, we're trying on another role of someone else and it might, you know, have a more spiritual cloak on, but again, it's your frequency and only you through tuning into your own energy and cutting out that noise are going to be able to access that. That that's just, it's just a powerful understanding. And I love that as you discover this and you go on the journey of actually discovering all the things that really light you up in your life. Um, there is this, I guess, understanding of somebody that's spiritual is like, that's a renunciate and lets everything go and lives a very simple life, which is beautiful. And I feel like the people that need to have power on this planet need to be conscious individuals. And like, there's this new era of like the spiritual CEO and people that are actually um, not just living the either or lifestyle, but both. Mm-hmm. And you can have it all. Like you can you can live a spiritually driven life and have practices and um, find vibrancy and show up in the world and actually create infrastructure. And like having that balance of masculine and feminine energies is is super needed um, mm-hmm. for individuals on yeah on an individual and collective level right now. Yes. So um, I yeah I'm curious for you that somebody that's doing a lot and you have you know written many books and you have a big podcast and you're speaking and doing these mystery schools and like mm-hmm. you're doing a lot. And you're being able to hold a lot, which is so beautiful. And in the spiritual community, not a lot of people, unfortunately, have developed the capacity to do so Mm -hmm. far. And so um, how is that journey? I know there's been a couple of pivotal moments in your life where it's kind of activated and been a catalyst for you to step into that more. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I would just love for you to riff on a little bit of how um, we as spiritual beings are also spiritual, we, we are creators. And it's allowing us, once we kind of find that attunement with Zorus and we find um, what really lights us up. We have so much energy to create what we want to create and mm-hmm. have that be of service to people. Yeah. I remember being in Bali when I was, you know, 23 and seeing all these spiritual people and I was so inspired and I'm like, I need to live here for the rest of my life and be going to kirtans and ecstatic dance and drinking green juice all day. And like, this is amazing. Month one, amazing. Month two, I'm starting to notice some things. Hmm, I'm noticing that no one's doing anything. <laughs> you know. And then in month three, I'm noticing they're talking a lot about doing all these things. Still no one's doing anything. Month four, I'm like, okay, I need to leave, you know? <laughs> And what I recognized was that living in a healing bubble can be a huge way to negate your responsibility of actually living your purpose and Mm -hmm. being of service. And that we can wear this guise of, I am not healed enough. I have another past life to heal. I have to rebirth myself. I need to heal this family member and that family member. And of course, see this and that shaman. And then of course, go into my Reiki level 300. And then, you know, the list goes on. And The beauty is there's always going to be more modalities for you to step into. But what I saw a lot of these people doing was they thought that they were like changing the world, but it was only in this tiny little bubble of like preaching to the choir. And it wasn't actually going out there and creating ripple effects in the world. So I realized then that if I actually wanted to 
raise the vibration of the planet and be of service and have these types of conversations, I can't just be in this tiny little circle of people who are talking about doing it, but really aren't embodying it. And I see this happen a lot, especially as people dive into spirituality, because it comes from, a. Re I honestly think it comes from a really good place. It comes from this place of, I don't want to say anything when I still might not be like totally healed. So let me work on this thing and that thing. But the thing is, again, it's the ego telling you, you're still not good enough. You're still not ready enough. You're still unworthy. And it's the exact same story. So my best advice for people who are in that and are still needing to take another course and do another thing is where you were at right now is further along in your journey than most people in the world, you know, and even think about the version of you that was you three years ago. And what have you learned three years ago to now? And how can you help just build that bridge for people? You know, three years ago, maybe you were struggling with self-love or whatever the thing was. What were the practices that helped you? What were the revelations that helped you? What were the insights you made? And speak to that person. It doesn't need to be the entire world. It doesn't need to be people you don't know. Just speak to that version of you. And then as we continue to learn, we're climbing up this ladder, this perpetual, never-ending spiraling ladder at that. Mm -hmm. But there's always going to be people in that certain ladder, maybe it's the ladder of meditation or the ladder of relationships or the ladder of whatever the thing is for you that are just starting to get on this ladder or just a few steps behind you on this ladder and, and giving them a hand. And the beauty of that is then we realize everyone's further along on some ladders than we are too. Yep. So there's always going to be people to learn from and there's always going to be people that we can teach from where we're at right now. And also sometimes still being in the muck a little bit is helpful for people. Yeah. Because if I was like, I have my PhD in anxiety, I have been studying anxiety for 40 plus years. And, you know, I remember once 40 years ago, I was anxious. <laughs> Can't really remember what that felt like, but I have done a lot of research on it. Yeah. It's like, that's not going to help. But if I'm like, hey, I still wake up anxious on most days. And this is what I do to help me get to where I'm at right now. That to me is so much more helpful because you're in the experience right now, especially as the world changes too, that like, Discovering your purpose today is very different than discovering your purpose 30 years ago, you know? So don't feel like you need to have it completely figured out to be able to help. It's you actually sharing the fact that you're still struggling with that is what's going to make it resonate with the people that you're here to support. Mm. I love that. And it's it can be expressed in so many different right, ways, right? We are in the education communicative space where it's, you know, and a lot of our friends are also in that, but right, like, it could show up in so many different ways, whether it's music or some sort of art. I feel like anybody in their like utmost level of mastery will it it inherently feel like a form of art. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I love the relatability that no matter where you're at in your journey, like you can connect with people at that stage, and you don't have to wait till you're some enlightened guru or like some idealized um, place some way off in the future that is really uh, just masquerading. Uh, inner feeling of inadequacy and like that you're not going to, yeah. you know, work, it's not going to work out or you have all these fears and it's like, it's important to get clear on what the actual motive of you pushing something off. And I do think that there is usefulness in um, clearing the vessel before sharing and like really stepping into your, you know, sharing of the world and whatever expression that is. But to a certain point, you know, if you're like mm -hmm. 10 years down the road and you're like, we're not meant to be healing our whole life. Right. We're meant to be thriving and sharing and connecting and healing throughout parts for sure. Mm -hmm. But it, um, yeah, it can get, that identity can get stuck. Yeah, and even looking at where does our concept of healing come from? Because oftentimes we're taking this Western clinical approach to healing that we think healing is psychoanalyzing alone in a dark room and talking about the problem again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And in most places around the world, that's not even what healing looks like. Like, I don't know if you heard about the tribe in Rwanda that kicked out the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So it's a really interesting story that after the Rwandan genocide, the U.S. government sent their top psychologists and psychiatrists to work with the victims of the genocide. And after a few days, the village kicked them out. The government's like, excuse me, like, those are our top people here. And they're like, no, 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 I think you sent the wrong people. And they're like, why so? And they're like, because those people wanted us to leave the community and be in a dark room alone and keep talking about what happened. But in Rwanda, the way that we heal is we go outside and we join hands under the sun and we sing and we dance and we tell stories. That is how we heal. Mm -hmm. 
And to even look at this concept of healing, of needing to be this thing you need to fix and you need to mentally construct. What if healing is creativity? You know, as kids, we didn't need to psychoanalyze what was going wrong with us. We just played and we naturally came back into harmony. Yeah. So I really believe that this clutching on to the healing journey that we have is again, this like colonial mindset repackaged to us, but to be able to use creativity as our form of healing to again, just like service, it gets you out of your story. It gets you out of your head and allows you to be a channel of something greater than you. And then the things that you were worried about, they turn into art and then you're so inspired by them yeah. that you're grateful that it all happened. Yeah. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Shout out Rwanda. Yes. They're doing it like Wakanda. Yes. <laughs> so like, yes. Uh, and so many parts of the world, healing has been through dance, through song, through, you know, all, all of these different forms of movement that we're finally now remembering. But again, our colonial mindset conditioning has made us think, oh, shaking, that's barbaric. Yeah. You know, being in a tribe, barbaric, primitive. Yeah. And it's so important for us now to realize our own internal conditioning we have around these things. And this, again, belief that some teacher, guru, psychologist, whoever the thing is can heal us when really only we carry the, the yeah. codes to heal ourselves. Yeah, no, it's powerful. And I want to touch on also because it's been a part of your journey the past couple of years is this identity that we can develop as we go on the spiritual journey as being a spiritual person. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how good of a yogi can I be and how much Kriya yoga am I doing? And the uh, spiritual identity can become suffocating to us in, in like limiting in our ideas of what spirituality really means, right? Is like, it's either yoga, it's meditation, it's, you know, the things that people typically perceive as spiritual, but that identity can be suffocating in its own ways because we are creative beings. And I feel like a lot of times, especially in ancient wisdom traditions, creativity isn't talked about a whole lot mm -hmm. as a form of like your spiritual practice. And so, um, yeah, there is, we're here to taste it all in the full spectrum of the human experience. And even as you've been like, you know, uh, tasting the different flavors of dance and DJing and like all the forms of artistically how we want to create, I think it's important to just not limit ourselves in what we think uh, our idea of spirituality is. Because again, it's just, it can be suffocating and limiting to us expressing the fullness of who we are. Totally. It just becomes another, you know, I used to wear whatever Levi jeans and a jersey and now I wear white, all white and mala beads. And it's just like another costume yeah. that people are wearing and the way that they have to speak. And, you know, I did it too. Like I was doing Ashtanga yoga three hours a day, fasting, raw vegan, like, and it was, I think I needed that like break from where I was before, which was like going to the club and drinking, you know, that, yeah. but then I realized I just put myself in another pigeonhole of like identifying with like a culture rather than my own way of being. And mm -hmm. I think it's important, like even with me stepping into DJing, for example, this past week I DJed at a festival and I got complaints because they were like, oh, that music was ratchet. <laughs> and it was so fascinating for me because I'm like, oh, wow, like that a lot of it is, is internalized racism um, and patriarchal conditioning because when we see something that's like, of the hip hop culture, especially black and, and brown cultures. We see that as ratchet. We see that as not enlightened, not sophisticated. But if we are doing a tantric eye gazing orgy, all of a sudden <laughs> that's spiritual. <laughs> so why can't you say my neck, my back, but you can do the tantric eye gazing orgy. What is the difference there? I'm asking that question. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah, it's, it's so real. It's so true. <laughs> yeah, we've just decided like, oh, because you know, they have dreadlocks and now it's spiritual, but like, God forbid they're, you know, wearing stripper heels. Now it's trashy. And it's like, we're really, it's like the spiritual community wants to talk about, we're so open, we're so this and that, but then you hear back that ass up and then all of a sudden all your conditioning comes back online. So like, where's the work? Oh, where's the work? You got to allow, allow that ass to be backed up, everyone. Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes that ass needs to be backed up. Exactly. Yeah. And and again, like even the roots of that, like where does it come from? It comes from, you know, like twerking comes from African dance and the conditioning there was that's primitive, that's barbaric, that's not classy. So we've still taken on that same conditioning of things that have roots and other cultures are not as sophisticated as, you know, for whatever reason, we've taken a lot of these um, 
aesthetic Indian practices such as like meditation, but we, we've completely discarded the feminine practices, you know, of the Shakti, the, the dancing, like those things are not allowed, but like the things that felt safe for us. And there was this beautiful book I was reading about, sh- it's called Shaking Medicine. And it's about like the history of shaking as like a form of, um, spirituality because every culture has had shaking like as a form of releasing trauma and when the um the colonizers came to different regions and they saw people meditating and they saw people shaking in other communities the shaking was scary for them because if someone's shaking you don't know what they're going to do next it's this feeling of like they're uncontrollable so that actually became illegal to practice you know a lot of the african traditions native american traditions a lot of native american practices they couldn't even practice until 1971 in the united states you know so those things became literally outlawed even ayurveda in india was outlawed during british rule but then the things that were like a person just sitting and meditating it was like okay they're easier to control. I'm not afraid of what direction they're going to go in. So, so you can do that practice. And it's the same conditioning that we have now. If you're seated and just chanting and a nothingness, that's safe. If you're showing any signs of your wild nature, that is not. Yeah. It's just so slippery, like the spiritual ego that comes in and it creates just another level of separation when the idea of coming into it is to realize the inherent unicity that we all have and to have compassion for our brothers and sisters. And then we um, go into the world and the identity of being spiritual creates a uh, a, a pedestal in which you're looking at other people on, like, look at all these non-spiritual people. <laughs> and uh, it's you're right back where you started, you know, yeah, and, and it's a part of the journey and to have compassion for yourself. Like yes. it's kind of inevitable in, in many ways as you grow and then it becomes integrated and then you can have and you can make space for the full spectrum of your human experience and then therefore everyone else's. And I think, and I made this assumption too, that like to be spiritual meant you had certain knowledge of certain things. And that's not actually what spirituality is. It's like, oh, if I can name the Merkaba and the Tentahedron and the this and that, then I must be spiritual. And it's like, no, that's knowledge on certain areas of which there are many folds and pathways that you can learn. But first of all, every human inherently has a spirit. So every human inherently is spiritual, right? And when we have this understanding of like, spirituality is I need to know instead of actually being in practice. And I would always do this. I would want to just get more and more information, more information, more information, because if I knew more then I was like more spiritual, mm-hmm. you know, so then I'm not actually, it's like, I'm reading about meditation, I'm not doing the meditation. I'm reading about the dance, I'm not doing the dance because again, it's that ego of like, well, I need to know all the buzzwords that the people are saying so right. I can be in the conversation. Yeah. So you can be accepted into the tribe and the community. It's just, you know, wanting to be a part of the gang. Exactly. <sighs> powerful yeah it's 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 important and the practices are beautiful but it's just are you doing your spiritual practices because they're actually benefiting your life or because you like the way they look on you right and uh, it's just important to gain awareness in that. or because you you are gaslighting yourself into thinking that they are the mm-hmm. thing that you're supposed to be doing because it's worked for someone else. And I think it's very natural if something works for us to want to like scream about it from the top of our lungs and be like, everyone needs to, you know, do Kundalini or do ayahuasca or do this or do that. Yeah. But what I feel right now, like, you know, before we were in the information age, they're actually calling this new age that we're in post 2020, the conceptual age. And we really are in this conceptual age. The information age was like, how do I accumulate more information, go to a four-year college and get a degree because we needed to have information in this world that we didn't have internet, et cetera. But now we have too much information, right? Mm -hmm. So how can we conceptualize and synthesize and connect back to our intuition, make decisions on this information? And I really believe that that's the code to really unlock your dharma in this new paradigm. Mm. Yeah, it's it's so important and kind of circles back to what we were talking about earlier, just like the information overload that we have. It's so much more valuable to empty your mind than to fill it because you we are all inherently energetic beings that are um, at some dimension within us connected to source. And that has the answers to all of life's issues or problems or things that come up. And so you have them all within you. It's just, again, removing what's in the way of that and, and, and tapping back into, back into that. Um, okay, beautiful. Deep breath. Congrats if you've been listening this far. You've been doing so well. This is this has been so good. I've been loving all the avenues in which we've been diving into. I kind of have like a uh, a rapid fire. It can be like a medium fire speed question round okay. because we can riff on some of them. But um, yeah, I want to keep diving deeper. So 
Um, yeah, if you feel called to answer in one word or one sentence, or we can riff on a few because there's going to be some that elicit that, then we can go for it. Cool. What uh, what single book has impacted your life the most and why? Mm, I really loved the book Journey of the Soul by Gary Zukov. Have you read that? I haven't. It's beautiful. I really recommend it to everyone. It was just almost like the things that I've felt before, just to like read it back and reflect it to you. It's like, oh, we all are connected to the same unified field. Mm, powerful. Yeah. When did you when did you read that? Mm, almost 10 years ago, I want to oh, say. Wow. Yeah. So powerful. I yeah. feel like I love those books that just really impact us. And every time we read them, we're a different version of yes, ourselves. Yes. So it's like, it's fun even for me to explore some books that have been really impactful on my journey. Yeah. Too. Even it was, I don't remember which Deepak Chopra book it was, but it was one of his books. And it was before I met him and had worked with him. I always very much looked up to him. And he just said, you are not your personality. And I was like, what? how am I not my personality? Like, <laughs> and just reading that line, it was just such a game changer to me to, cause it's like, we've always identified with like, I am this, I am that my relationships with people. So a lot of Deepak books have also made a huge impact in my life. Mm, beautiful. How has an apparent failure in life set you up for a later success? Ooh, I mean, I was rejected by over 30 publishers for my book. They all said, they all echoed back the exact things my parents told me and all of my fears. You're not a doctor. You're too young. No one cares. No one's interested in Ayurveda. So like that would have been a really good time to just be like, okay, I guess this isn't happening. I just wasted two years of my life writing this book. And with being rejected by all those publishers, it opened me up to essentially writing a new book on Ayurveda, which became The Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda. Yeah. And I needed to write that book first before my own interpretation because it was almost like my dissertation mm. of like really understanding Ayurveda for what it is. And through that process of writing that book, it really opened me up also as a channel because I would be, I would just be writing things and coming through me like specific Ayurvedic information that I just couldn't be making up. Mm. So I'm sometimes in life, like we have like the 10 year from now view, but you need to do the like pay your dues thing right now. Yeah. So for me, like writing that 400 plus page textbook on Ayurveda was what I needed to then know the subject so well in and out that then I could add my own interpretation to yeah, it. That's beautiful. Also, I just want to, I want you to share a little bit here because, because we're here. Um, I feel like when you're doing actions that are aligned with your dharma mm -hmm. the universe just sort of like starts supporting you in all these mysterious ways it's like yes. here you go you're doing this like a, a green light from the universe thumbs up yes. and one of those moments was when deepak kind of you know co-signed you in a big way yeah. when you were on this journey so do you want to share a little bit about that synchronistic story because i think yeah. it's beautiful so, you know, whenever I was fighting with my parents, I'd be like, one day I'm going to be like Deepak Chopra, but helping millennial woman, they're like, you're crazy. And he's crazy. Like, you know, they were not a fan. And it was always someone I looked up to. And, you know, then in my journey of writing that book and then being rejected by all of the publishers. And then that same agent was approached by the Idiot's Guide people looking for someone to write the Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda. And, um, you know, I basically read every single idiot's guide book you could ever imagine and just sent them the table of contents, sent them the first chapter, and then I was hired. So it was right before the book was going to be published, and I happened to be at a conference. And I did not know that Deepak was, was going to be there. He happened to be sponsoring it. So he just came on stage. He's like, hello, everyone, and just walks off. Mm -hmm. And I just knew in that time, like, I'm probably never going to see him again in my life. So, like, let me walk up to him and just say thank you you know, and the whole crowd of a thousand plus people in this auditorium were leaving. And I just start like something bigger than me took over. I'm just going down the stairs. And then I'm like walking up the stairs of the stage and I just walk up to him. And he's like having a conversation with someone. It was the lunch break. And I'm just standing next to him. I'm like, I have no idea what I want to say when he <laughs> turns and looks at me, but I need to say something. And, um, he's like, hello. And I'm like, you know, thank you so much for writing your books. You're a huge inspiration to me. I would love to send you um, the PDF of my book. So I send it to him and I'm like, pinnacle of my life. I sent him my ebook. Like, didn't think anything more would happen after that. And the next day I was walking, I was visiting New York at that time and I was about to cross the street and I heard an old man behind me say, can someone help me cross the street? I was so busy. I had so much going on. I was eating while walking, but something came over me and said, Sahara, if you say you're such a good person, help this man cross the street. So I turn around and I look at him and he was this 
like homeless looking man. And I'm like, Hey sir, like I can help you cross. Like, where do you want to go? And he takes my arm and he's like, okay, take me two blocks down, down the stairs into the subway. And I'm like, okay, sure. At this point, I'm just going to miss my meetings and that's okay. So I take this man by the arms and we're walking and, you know, he had like a very discolored face. He had a really strong smell to him. He had bags in his hand, like someone that most people would like not even want to look at. And we're like linking arm by arm. And I'm like, so where are you from? And we start talking and he was a refugee from Iraq. And we start having this conversation about just his journey and my parents' journey and finding all of these parallels with each other. And then finally I put him in the elevator to go down the subway. And I'm like, by the way, sir, where are you going? He's like, oh, I'm going to this university. I'm a professor of physics. I'm like, oh, wow, that was interesting. Like, so I'm, I walk away from that like, wow, that's the very Humans of New York experience I would have never imagined. Uh -huh. And um, I check my email and this is like a Saturday too. I check my email and there's an email from Deepak Chopra. And I'm like, what? And it's like, what's your number? I want to call you. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm in trouble. <laughs> like he's <laughs> mad at me. <laughs> like something happened. I'm so scared. And that email was sent exactly like to the minute of the man, the time that I put that man in the elevator. So I give him my number and he calls me like right then. And he's like, what are you doing on Tuesday? And I'm like, oh, I don't actually live in New York. Like I was living with my grandma in LA. I'm like, I have to go back to LA. He's like, great, because on Tuesday morning, I'm doing a You Are the, the Universe lecture and I want you to come and have a meeting with you after. And it was in San Diego. I was like, sure, I'll be there. So like I, I go and I, I literally slept in my car the night before, I think. Like I was had no money or anything going on at this stage of my life still. And I went, I was so nervous, like, going to have a conversation with my life idol. And then after he like walks off stage, he's like, you come with me. He takes me to this um, like hotel room that he had. And there were like four people on his team. They're like asking me all these questions of like, why are you there? Like this, that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I answer. And then he's like, I read your book and I really love the way that you shared Ayurveda and modernized it. And I would love to have you on faculty of our team at Jaya, which was the app that he was working on at the time, part of Chopra, and to endorse your book. And I was like, what? Like, like two seconds ago, I was like getting rejected by all the publishers, just writing this book. Like even, even after writing the book, I barely got paid for it. I was like studying for a real estate exam, just like trying to figure it out to like all of a sudden Deepak Chopra is endorsing my book. He wrote the forward eventually of three of my books. And that to me was like the universe being like, oh bitch, you got to get on track. You know, <laughs> like don't forget your magic. And it needed to be reflected back to me of something like bigger than me to remind me of what I am really here to do. And it was interesting because I believe that that man that I saw, that homeless man, wasn't a human. I really believe that he was an angel that was seeing, would you respect another doctor of physics, just like Deepak Chopra, if he was not helping you, if he was not someone that people looked up to, if he was actually the person that was taking you off your path, the person that people ignored, the person that people don't want to look at, would you respect him the same way that you would respect someone like Deepak Chopra? Mm -hmm. And the fact that I said yes in that experience, I believe is why this happened. Mm -hmm. Such a powerful story. And I mean, you could look at it and say coincidence, but also I truly believe that life will test you to actually show up who you say, who you say you are. Yep. And, and, that was a moment where you were, you know, tested and you could definitely perceive it as just like energetically those cords are, are kind of attached and then boom, next moment, now your life. I mean, both doctors, physics, like you can't make this shit up. And, you know, so I remember later Deepak did a Facebook live and he talked about meaningful synchronicities and how life was always meant to be lived in flow. And I sent him an email and I'm like, I don't know, like, are you sure? Like, you know, don't periods of flow have to be followed by periods of inertia just to, you know, balance it out. And he's like, if life is not lived in flow, there's something wrong. And that to me, I was like, wait, so this can be my new normal? Like I can always have incredible experiences and encounters and one door takes me to the next, which takes me to the next conversation. Like this is actually what life is meant to be lived like when you're in, a, in alignment because we're so used to life's tough, get a helmet or if things are going good, it's going to start going bad soon. So brace yourself. And I was actually bracing myself for like, 
the next bad thing to happen after this because it can't always be this good, right? Yeah. And I later learned of this concept of uh, Dharma, Karma, and Kriya. So in Vedic concepts, it's like we're all born in alignment with our Dharma. And I like to think of it like a highway and Dharma's at the end of the highway and you're going down this highway, you're on cruise control, you're, you're in your full truth, but then off this highway are exits. And these exits are like, hey, you'll make more money doing this or your parents will be more proud of you if you do that or everyone in your school does this or everyone in your town does that. And, you know, they're, they're taking us off track. And sometimes we do go off this track and the universe responds to us first tap, tap, tap. You're feeling anxious. Something's feeling off. Most of us, we don't pay attention. We keep going. And then it's punch, punch, punch. Like maybe you're having panic attacks. Maybe you're, you know, really hitting roadblocks. But again, we think life's tough, get a helmet, keep going. And then it might have to be as huge as a collision or an on your knees moment or something that you have no choice but to turn around. And for some people, they still don't. And that's living in karma. And karma is not out to get you, but really it's like the barricades on the highway to keep you in alignment with your dharma. It's because life is not meant to be a series of unfortunate events that always sucks and every day keeps getting harder. If you're feeling that way, that just means you're off track. And it's the universe response to push you in the direction of flow where it does feel good. So then when we move back to that direction, we're going towards our dharma, we experience what is called kriya the effortless action of living our dharma. And that's when you're reading the right people at the right time and having the right conversations, listening to the podcast that tells you the thing that leads to the next conversation that you're going to have after this episode. And, you know, that is what you're designed to feel like. It's just we live in a society that is so collectively living in karma that when we're in Korea, we doubt ourselves and sometimes we like self-sabotage and get ourselves out of it. Mm. Powerful. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing. So good. Okay, what is... The most worthwhile investment you've made in yourself and it could be with time energy or money i would say like leaving my family and everyone that i knew and, and traveling alone and living in india and living in bali that to me was like a huge just pattern interrupt that i needed to recultivate my understanding of myself so i would say any kind of solo travel for people mm. love that yeah I I'll resonate with that for sure. Yeah. Um, what is an unusual habit or absurd thing that you love? Um, an unusual habit. Hmm. I mean, sometimes I watch the Kardashians. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm really into psychoanalyzing. Like, oh, like, why is this in the collective? Why are people so interested in this? And, like the feminine masculine polarity is happening. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's probably a part of you too that just really enjoys watching it. <laughs> totally. I'm like, wow, they're like Armenians. I feel like, like I actually had a dream the other day and it was Kim Kardashian telling me to like go for my DJ career. So maybe <laughs> she's like my spirit guide. There we go. <laughs> it's all sacred, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I love yeah. that. Um, in the last few years, what is a new habit or belief or behavior that has most fundamentally changed your life? Mm. I would say dancing as a spiritual practice has definitely been the biggest thing. It used to be like, oh, like to dance is to go to a dance class and like learn choreography and like to do it as the vessel, as the experience. Um, so whether it's actually going to ecstatic dance places, facilitating my own, or even just taking a moment at home and like playing a song and like letting my body unleash, it opens me up to higher levels of creativity, of joy, of healing than anything else. And also breath work. It was always a practice that I, for some reason, had in my head, you have to go to like a breath work journey and it can only be there, but just to every single day for 10 minutes doing a breath work practice. Like even at the beginning of this podcast, it's the quickest thing I think that can really change your state. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. That flows nicely into the next one, which is what do you do whenever you feel overwhelmed? What's something that supports you? I go on walks outside, mm. you know, just to let my body be in motion. It's for me, it's hard if I'm very overwhelmed and then just like sit and meditate because my mind is going so fast, but to just like play some music or listen to a podcast and let myself walk and be in that Vata flow energy is really helpful for me. Um, also journaling. If there's like something I'm really like making a big decision about or unsure about just to let it all out on a piece of paper really helps me discern my own thoughts. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I am in the same boat. What uh, What's one moment or event in your life that has allowed you to like learn the most about yourself that we haven't talked about today? Mm. 
I would say it was when my dad disowned me because when that happened, it made me realize like how much I was still living for his approval. So then to be told I was dead to him and that he wanted nothing to do with me anymore allowed me to realize that I had no one else to live for but myself. Mm. And that gave me the freedom that I needed. Mm. Powerful. I, I'm curious to hear more about that story. I'm just sensitive to the time we've been going for a little bit, but that's, yeah. I can't even imagine like that. And I've had a couple of people close to me that have also had similar experiences with their family. And then also just like understanding the Middle Eastern patriarchy and like that's in my bloodline as well. So I, I totally feel that and understand that. And um, must have been so difficult in the moment and has shaped you largely to be able to serve people in the way that you do now. Mm-hmm. Mm. Absolutely. And, you know, for a while too, I was just like, why did that, you know, it's like you make sense of everything in your life, but like, why would that happen to me? Like, it's just like, why would anyone think that about their child? But it was, that's the extreme. That's the karma that I needed to experience to get me off of this track of living my life for anyone else. Mm. Powerful. Yeah. So good. It's very clear to me and probably the listeners as well, but like what, if you had to share, what is your strongest calling and how you wish to inspire the world and like leave your imprint? And like, how, how do you, what frequency and, and, and words do you want to share of, of how you want to inspire the world on your time here? Mm. You know, the energy I've really been tuning into that the world needs more than anything right now is joy, you know, because even on our purpose journey, if we let go of the joy, it's going to drown us. So to have joy practices and to not feel guilty around joy, like you can simultaneously feel and even carry the weight of the world and also allow yourself to experience joy. Like even what's happening right now in Iran, like every single day I'm seeing another young girl massacred by this government. My family still lives there and I'm still choosing to dance, you know? So really what I feel is most important right now is for us to to take the the courage that it really takes to, because it's so easy to be pessimistic about the world. It's so easy to just point out all of the shadows, like we get it, it's there. But to continue to choose joy, even in little acts in moments like this is really what the world needs. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Ditto. Love it. Agree. Mm -hmm. Fully. Thank you so much. This whole conversation has been filled with so many nuggets and uh, it's just been a pleasure to get to know you and to see in which ways we can continue to weave. And like, I just love being in this energy of conversation. I think it's really needed. You're living your Dharma. (laughs) We're doing it. Yeah. So good. Um, All right. Well, where can people find more of you if they want to see, if they want to dive deeper into Sahara Rose and your offerings and Rose Gold Goddesses and things that you have going on? Yes. So my website is IamSaharaRose.com. So over there, you'll find the Dharma Archetype Quiz. I have a free masterclass on discovering your soul's purpose and um, embodiment practices and a lot more. So IamSaharaRose.com. And that's also my Instagram. Amazing. Beautiful. Is there anything else that you want to share? just have fun too. Like a huge other part of my journey has just been like doing things for the sake of fun Mm. and not everything needs to even like be around your purpose, even being around productivity, just doing things simply because you feel good. That also is enough. Yeah. It's such a balance. Like, uh, yeah. Play is just like doing activities with no needed purpose at all. Mm-hmm. And our being in our place. And that actually purpose. is what fuels your purpose. It's mm-hmm. the things that you're not doing on purpose is what actually is your purpose. Yeah. All that joy. Yes. Beautiful. Awesome. Thank you so much. All you beautiful humans that have been tuning into the Know Thyself podcast today. Uh, yeah. Just thank you for coming on this journey. And it is my pleasure and honor to be doing this. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Check out Sarhar Rose and all the links will be linked down in the description. If you haven't checked out our separate Know Thyself Clips channel where we chop these episodes up into more snackable, digestible pieces of content. It's also linked below. Thank you so much. Until next time, be well.